I didn't. I couldn't figure out what to do. So I just read the first couple of pages, and then maybe a little thing later. Um, this is the beginning. It was maybe 10:30 p.m. early October 1974, a time of profound spiritual dislocation and emotional collapse. Only scientists had computers. Television had not yet begun dictating public behavior. And some people even lived without phones. The level of dialogue in the street was less confined. There were three eggs frying in a pan along with some leftover Chinese rice. Half of a bottle of Jim Beam was waiting on the window ledge when Tanya McCoy climbed into that window on the southwest side of Portland, Oregon. It was my window, but she was looking for somebody else. She knocked the bean bottle off the ledge and I heard it break in the alley below just as I cranked up the volume on the radio. The song was Janis Joplin's Piece of My Heart. I thought it should, I should have thought it meant something, but I wasn't thinking anything really. I began singing along in a theatrical manner. I used such music as a purgative, get drunk, go through my repertoire of gut-wrenching facial expressions, wring my heart like a rag of tears. Usually I felt better in the morning. But if I looked stupid doing it, she looked ridiculous watching. Dressed in a stocking hat, railroad overall, strapped and buckled, square-toed fry boots, she was packing a bottle of Gallo Tawny Port in a joint of Vietnamese bozo weed. She said, all right, as if she could identify with my folly. We apologized. She apologized for the loss of whiskey as she twisted the cap off the port for a toast. Within hours, we had sown the seeds of our middle-class discontent and would spend the next three years running towards or away from our separate demons. Think Heloise and Abelard, Dante and Beatrice, Hammett and Hellman, Humbert and Lolita Hayes. This wasn't one of the great love stories of the ages, though. To tell the truth, I'm not even sure it was a love story. I'm not sure love stories exist other than as models for emotional oppression concrete walls erected by tiny romantic sadists in our minds to batter our souls against like bags of broken toys. But if it wasn't the stuff of legend, it was a story of passive obsession and two people who thought they could turn their ennui into a religion. Romantic fatalism aside, we would be travelers in strange times. The previous heavy decade had degenerated into some sort of collective entertainment anxiety. Individualism was about to come, become a disease rather than a cure. People were dropping like flies from various vague illnesses. One guy I knew went crazy from what he called the fun, a term he used to describe this ominous evil out there manipulating him, turning him into a party animal against his will. This fun looked like a clown or a punk from a nightclub or a babe from a beer ad. Sometimes it looked like his own face in a hotel mirror. Another guy died from what was later called denial. Actually, it was the same guy. Then there was the fear, but that's been around a long time under different names. Some called it the horror, others knew it as the face in the mirror. But that's pretty much it. Kurtz and Bozo hand in hand, walking through the collective psyche in bell bottoms and running shoes. Of course, these days, those days seem like a veritable renaissance. But you can't go back, so this is how my story begins. The story of Frank Payne and Tanya McCoy. It begins with fried eggs and whiskey in my Portland, Oregon kitchen and Janice Joplin. I'm going to skip ahead here. Memory can be a tricky thing, even a tacky thing. It uses you. You might remember killing someone and you didn't do it. Many people do. They say the bedroom is the most dangerous room on earth. Police know it. Emergency room workers can tell you all about it. I wish I could say such passion was mine to regret, but reconstruction is hard. They say it's in my head, my sin. Apparently this is true. There are already enough people who have as their mission in life the extinction of a fire, of the fire. I read that once, Simon de Beauvoir. It's a nice thought that the soul is not immortal by nature, that it can only become so if fed. So I guess the road is more food than geometry, more consumption than myth. In fact, the modern road story is the opposite of myth. There's no heroes, there are barely any actors. There are only observers and what might be called events or non-events. As time goes on, you move less and less. No one feels they make anything happen except maybe by bumping into things, moving through life as a means of making contact with the world. But the harder you look, the further it recedes. 
There's the 14-year-old girl you loved as a child, or the stepfather who sent you into a psychological tailspin. They dissipate, mutate, and reconjugate. The effect redefines the cause. A car and its driver tri traveling down the highway might think they're fighting fate when they're really only illustrating the second law of thermodynamics. The white queen bandages her finger and begins to bleed. Then comes the act that wounds. Backwards is the direction of order. Without punctuation, the sentence can't mean anything. The mistake you made is the last thing you see. Um, I guess I just want to read one more little section. <coughs> Maybe I should just... No, no, no. <laughs> Keep going. All right, I'll just read this one thing. This is, ha this is when they, they get to Los Angeles, and they're in a, uh, they're in a room doing dr drugs with some people. The room was overlit with fluorescent bulbs, which gave it the aura of a porno movie set or an emergency room as if the relationship between the erotic and the pornographic, and even the traumatic for that matter, could be boiled down to nothing more than the light level. Somehow the religious figured in there too. God, headlights, floodlights, flash, fame, ecstasy. There was some kind of connection, but you wouldn't find it if you were looking for it. Still the artificial light in the room made the actual sunlight seem thin and tired, as if it had been late afternoon for an excruciating amount of time, and the natural light just couldn't justify itself anymore. I looked around, people talked. I should have been interested, but I wasn't. I decided reading magazines was the exciting thing to do in this case. In a, in a magazine about country home decorating, there was an article about folk singers, the folk revival in America, and how that was influencing home decorating. Then there was a picture of a family who lived in a home decorated the way folk singers might decorate their homes, except the home was in, in the magazine was clean. Then there were some pictures of old guys who still really were folk singers in a small town in Appalachia. Apparently they just sang for fun and didn't care about money. They had a certain authenticity. In the article they were reminiscing about their days on the road singing folk songs. Funny thing, then they started moving, the pictures that is, at least the lips in the pictures. The old folk singers were telling me to get out of town and hit the road. They said the answer was blowing in the wind and I ought to be chooping on down the highway. <laughs> I didn't like being told what to do, so I picked up a copy of Big Bike World. There were women in Big Bike World, stressed out white trash women draped over motorcycles like some kind of bikini-clad fungus. <laughs> One photo showed a naked woman soaping down a guy's Harley beside a country stream while he relaxed nearby drinking beer and reading Big Bike World, showing little surprise that his woman was also in the magazine washing his Harley. <laughs> He knew something lewd would take place soon. His faith went all the way back to the Industrial Revolution. The great Victorian bellows, the giant Jules Verne pistons, the churning camshafts deep inside some immense sweating motorcycle engine of the universe. In fact, if you tried, you could extrapolate all of thermodynamics from this simple scenario of impending biker sex. These magazines could take you straight to the heart of the cosmos without you even knowing it. Orgasm in production, capital in decay, cosmic truth, and biker bitches. I didn't have a big bike, I only had a BSA. I was wondering if they would let me in to heaven, into the heaven of big bike world with a BSA after I died. I developed an inferiority complex about it. Then, just as fast, I didn't care at all. Then again, I did. I wondered if big bike world was a good place to live. It seemed to be. Nobody spoke in Big Bike World. Nobody knocked on your door the way they did here in Venice, California at the beginning of the last quarter of the century, which was also the beginning of the end of the Industrial Age. It goes on from there, because yeah. the police knock on the door. Thank you.